thinking? What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week we focus on Rocky Flats. The United States nuclear weapons production facility near Denver, Colorado, that operated from 1952 to 1992. First, we talk with Kristen Iverson, author of the book *Full Body Burden: Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats*. She'll fill us in about the history and background of that site from her unique, up-close and personal perspective. Then. Terry Berry tells us about a little-known U.S. government program to compensate nuclear victims of Rocky Flats, a program that may have huge implications for the contaminated workers at the waste isolation pilot plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan, who got hit so hard with Fukushima radiation in the immediate aftermath of the start of that nuclear disaster. Those two interviews, plus numbnuts of the week. Activist shout out the "Get Me on John Stewart as Nuclear Pundit" campaign, tweet the Pope, and enough nuclear information to make Dick Cheney want to shoot someone else's face off. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, January twentieth, twenty fifteen, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Over in Japan, on a single day, two workers at Fukushima Daiichi. Were killed in separate accidents, one after falling more than 30 feet into a dry water tank, the other from a severe head injury while caught in equipment. These accidents came only three days after the Fukushima Labor Department urged TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, to take thorough precautions against accidents. Of course, last year. NPR reported that only about 100 out of 4,000 people working at Fukushima Daiichi every day are actual TEPCO employees. The rest are subcontractors. Things that live in seawater are not doing well, according to reports in Fukushima Diary. 81 percent of all tuna in an aquarium in the eastern part of Tokyo have died since the beginning of December. That's 129 out of 159 tuna in just a little over a month. The cause, of course, has not been identified yet. No one seems to have mentioned the fact that Fukushima Daiichi, with all of its radiation releases, is only 150 miles from Tokyo. But nuclear hot seat listener Jonathan Besson points out that this is at Kasai Rinkai Koen in Edogawa Ku. And that at one point they were incinerating radioactive debris from Fukushima nearby. Also in Tokyo, at the Ueno Zoological Gardens, a polar bear, harbor seal, giraffe, and Sumatran tiger have all died since November. Causes of death were variously acute pancreatitis, septicemia, heart failure, and multiple organ failure caused by tumor. In Hawaii. Eighty percent of the entire coral colony at the famed Kapoho tide pools are dying and bleaching, and sea creatures are sick, dying, or disappearing at an alarming rate all along the Pacific coast. Dying oysters, bleeding herring, melting starfish, hungry orcas, and sick seals are joined by dead seabirds, which led UC Santa Barbara's scientist Douglas McCauley to state. We may be sitting on a precipice of a major extinction event. The question mark is: Is it radiation fallout from Fukushima that is causing these die-offs? And now, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. 
For the first time since the triple meltdown began at Fukushima Daiichi in 2011, that prefecture is claiming victory over rice. Yes, that's right. They are saying that every bag of rice produced in Fukushima Prefecture last year cleared the required radiation tests. Officials are saying that in 2014, the use of fertilizers based on potassium chloride, which prevents the grain from absorbing the isotope cesium, are what created this magical change in the food supply. Well, it's true there is a principle called selective uptake, where having the right amount of a certain nutrient will stop the uptake of a radionuclide from the ground into a plant, or into specific organs or systems in the human body. Potassium chloride in the soil does seem to block the uptake of cesium into rice plants. However, that may not be exactly the same thing as saying the rice as safe. First of all, it bases its assumption on the fact that all the bags tested below 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram and believing that that level makes it safe to eat. It ignores the fact that 100 becquerels per kilogram in anything used to make it be considered nuclear waste. So the all-safe siren may have been sounding a wee bit prematurely. Then there was the suspected practice of mixing rice that may have measured above the 100 becquerels per kilogram of cesium with rice that measured below that level. And in mixing up the high and the low, when you average it out and measure the bag, ta-da, it comes out below the necessary breaking point. Doesn't mean that there might not be some hot, hot, hot little particles in there in your little individual grains of rice, but there's no way to know because, hey, they averaged it out. And a third thing for you to consider is that all that's being tested for is cesium. What about the other radionuclides? What about plutonium, strontium, americium, all the others? If you don't test for it, it doesn't show up. And so the assumption is that the rice is fine to eat. Well, for now, I'm planning to steer clear of any rice that is grown in Fukushima Prefecture. And quite frankly, in my humble opinion, if you decide it's okay to eat rice grown in Fukushima, then congratulations, you, yes, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. We'll have the week's interviews in just a few moments, but first, thanks to the generosity of you, my Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, I am going to be able to go to Dr. Caldecott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction. I can't wait for the sequel, and I'm excited that I'm going to be able to bring you up close and personal with the individuals who have come to participate, those who are speaking, all of the energy and the scrum and the excitement of what happens when well-versed anti-nuclear activists from literally around the world get together in one place at one time, share what they know, spark off each other and hit a critical mass of energy, excitement, enthusiasm, and vision for what we're going to be doing next. My airfare and hotel have now been covered, but I still need to cover some other expenses, including ground transportation, food, and coming from California to the middle of New York, probably some thermal underwear wouldn't be a bad idea. Know that everything goes towards supporting the show, my presence there, and my ability to bring you the best, most complete information possible out of that groundbreaking symposium. So if you would care to donate, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red Donate button. Know that anything you can do to help is tremendously appreciated, and you have my gratitude. This week... We're putting attention on Rocky Flats, the United States nuclear weapons production facility near Denver, Colorado, that operated from 1952 to 1992. Weapons production ended in 1989 after FBI agents raided the Rocky Flats facility, and operators of the site later pleaded guilty to criminal violations of environmental law. To fill in the picture of what Rocky Flats was all about, 
Nuclear Hot Seat talked with Kristen Iverson, author of Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. She gives us an up-close and personal perspective on what is now a nuclear waste dump that is being attempted to be turned into public parklands, tra-la, tra This interview is from Nuclear Hot Seat number 69, first broadcast on October 9, 2012, when Kristen's now award-winning book had just been published. Kristen Iverson grew up in Arvada, Colorado, near the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weaponry Facility. She is an associate professor at the University of Memphis, where she directs the MFA program in creative writing. As a writer, her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, Reader's Digest, among others, and she has appeared on C-SPAN and NPR's Fresh Air. In addition to her other books, she is the author of Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats, and that's why we're speaking with her today. Kristen, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me today. My pleasure. When you were growing up, how close did you live to Rocky Flats, and what, if anything, did you think or know about it? Well, when I was a, when I was a baby, we had a house in what's now called Old Town Arvada, which is about seven miles from the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. And then when I was around 11, um, my parents built a new house out of one of the new subdivisions that were springing up right around the plant. And that was around, about three miles uh, from the plant. And when I was a kid, we had no idea what was going on at Rocky Flats. It was operated by Dow Chemical at the time, and the rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. Was there any concern at all, any worry about what was made there or any possible contamination that might result? Well, as as residents, um, we had no idea of the environmental contamination. That didn't come out until much, much later, the extensive toxic and radioactive contamination that was um, moving directly into the neighborhoods, into my neighborhood. Um, so we really didn't have any idea. And there was so much secrecy around the plant. In the beginning, that was due to the Cold War, of course. But then as time went on, I think there were a number of other reasons as well. Uh, many of the kids that I knew growing up, their parents, worked at Rocky Flats, and the workers were not allowed to talk about their work. Everything was secret. Even workers at the plant uh, itself didn't know what other workers within the same area did. And so people would make things up about what they did. They wouldn't be allowed to talk to their families, um, so they would they would make up all kinds of stories about what was actually going on. Did this lead to any suspicion, or everybody just went, okay, fine, that's just what the way it is, and, and ignore it? Well, a combination of things. I I think there was always a great deal of of mystery and fear and suspicion about Rocky Flats, and particularly uh, in the 1970s with some of the activists and people who were protesting out there, you know, people began to wonder. But there were so many complicated feelings and emotions about Rocky Flats. Um, Some people, of course, felt that the plant was necessary, that, that we were winning the Cold War, that we won the Cold War because of what happened at Rocky Flats and the plutonium triggers that were produced there. Others, I think, um, and I think this is a very common thing for other facilities like this around the country, when you have a community that is so economically dependent upon something like this, people, are, you know, they have homes and properties and, and they kind of want to look the other way. Um, of course, at the same time, many people were very concerned about what was going on and any potential negative effect on their on their children. I have to say one of the hardest things when I was writing this book was letting my parents, my mother and father, know what it was um, that actually went on and the extent of contamination. They thought they were raising their children in, in the perfect environment, an idyllic environment. As a young single mother, you were even one of those people who were economically dependent upon Rocky Flats for a while. You worked there. What kind of a job did you have? And even when you worked there, how aware were you of what the facility was actually doing? Well, I look back on this, um, it was, it's kind of an astonishing thing to think about at this point. I had just come back, um, I'd worked in a, as a travel writer in Europe for a couple of years and just come back to go to graduate school and I was a single parent. And looking, I was looking for a job to help put myself through graduate school and I saw an ad in the paper. They had changed the name at Rocky Flats um, to the Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site. That, that, uh, that it makes change. it sound so much greener. <laughs> Exactly. I thought, oh, my gosh, they must have fixed everything up out there. And, of course, they hadn't. Um, 
And, but when I first went to work out there, I was very naive about what was going on. And I worked in the administration building, and I put together various reports um, from project managers and different managers around the plant, and those reports were sent on to Washington and Albuquerque and other places like that. So I was writing up things, writing about things that I didn't really fully understand at the time. While you were there, at some point you decided to keep a journal and start taking notes about what you were doing for your employer. That's not usual behavior for somebody who's working in a secretarial or a lower-level administrative job. What moved you to do so? Well, I think for one thing it's important to say that I've, I've always been a writer and I've always, uh, I take notes on everything, you know, regardless of what I'm doing and what I'm experiencing. But I also was enormously curious about when what went on at Rocky Flats and what it would feel like to work there and to be there and get to know, uh, you know, some of the people who worked there and have a sense of it. Rocky Flats was the big secret of my childhood, the big monolith of my childhood, and I really wanted to understand. So I, I wrote everything down and kept very careful notes of everything that was going on, and um, and it also it frightened me a little bit, and I wanted to be aware of as much as I could of what was going on. And I have to say, it wasn't until uh, one night when I, uh, one after late afternoon, I came home from work and um, fixed my kids their supper and put them to bed and came downstairs and turned on the television. And there was a Nightline expose on Rocky Flats. And uh, Department of Energy manager Mark Silverman was talking about uh, the extensive contamination and the fact that there was more than 14 tons of plutonium, much of it unsafely stored, at the plant. And uh, I was stunned. It was um, the first time that I really had a sense of what was going on, and that was true for a lot of people in, in the community and at the plant. Uh, I was absolutely stunned, and I could not believe that here I had grown up next to this plant, and I had worked at the plant, and I had no idea of the extensive um, toxic and radioactive contamination and what was going on. That was the moment that I knew I was going to quit my job, and the day I quit was the day that I knew I was going to write a book. And it just came time. to you as a result of the the emotional impact of all of this. Primarily, yes. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that I had actual verification uh, of what was going on. And it was stunning to me that they were interviewing people that I worked with on a daily basis uh, out at Rocky Flats. Um, it was a, Mark Silverman was one of the few managers out there at the time who um, felt that it was important for the public to begin to have a sense of, of what was going on and the kinds of costs and risks that we were um, involved with. You did massive research for this book, and one of the things that makes Full Body Burden so engrossing a read is that in addition to the investigative reporting that you did and putting it really well into the context of the Cold War, you tell your family's personal story. What led you? to decide to include this personal information as well as the nuclear information and the political information? Well, I wanted to put a human face on what I felt ultimately was a very inhumane story. And I wanted to tell the story of Rocky Flats through the eyes of the people who lived it, um, the people whose lives were affected by Rocky Flats, the workers, residents, um, activists, uh, everyone from Daniel Ellsberg to some of the nuns who protested out there, uh, and then people in my own neighborhood, um, many of the kids in my neighborhood, like myself, ended up working at Rocky Flats. And there were many, many people whose, whose health and lives were impacted very dramatically. And so I wanted to bring all of these stories together. It took an enormous amount of work and research. Ten years of, of research and writing went into this book. And I wanted it to read like a novel, but everything in the book is true. It's very heavily footnoted and fact-checked. And I wanted to uh, make it a kind of a narrative that people would want to read and read about the characters, the people who are in the story, and really understand the kind of impact that something like Rocky Flats had and continues to have on on people in the Denver area and certainly beyond. It's not just a local story by any means. What were some of the more alarming facts that you discovered in your research? Well, I think uh, a couple come to mind immediately with respect to what was going on at Rocky Flats. One, uh, there were many, many acronyms, um, of course, when I was typing up these reports, and one acronym that I kept coming across was MUF, M-U-F. MUF, what, does that, what is that? Well, I later learned that MUF stands for Missing Unaccounted for Plutonium, 
and it refers to the amount of plutonium that Rocky Flats basically lost over the course of about 38 years. And that amount is, is more than 3,050 pounds, and this is a Department of Energy figure. Um, other evidence suggests that it's actually much higher than that. And that's kind of an astonishing figure when you consider the fact that a millionth of a gram of plutonium, particularly if it's inhaled into the lungs, can, can cause a health effect or cause cancer. So they lost a lot of material over the years in the pipes, in the, in the ducts. Um, there are a lot of theories. Uh, the Department of Energy says some of that has to do with adm administrative errors, bookkeeping errors, and I'm not sure that's a very comforting fact either. What is the condition of uh, the Rocky Flats site today? Well, Rocky Flats has been cleaned up, although a lot of people uh, would like to call it a, a cover-up rather than a, a clean-up. When I worked at Rocky Flats in 1995, the Department of Energy said that it would take $37 billion and uh, 40 years to clean it up, and they weren't sure that they actually had the technology to do it. Of course, that's, that's an impossible figure, and um, what happened was a, a company called Kaiser Hill ended up coming in and doing the cleanup for about $7 billion in less than seven years. And what that means is that we have a, a very, we have very compromised cleanup standards. There's still a great deal of contamination, a great deal of plutonium out at the site. 1,300 acres of the site are so profoundly contaminated that they can never, ever be open to the public. The rest of the site has varying levels of contamination, some known and some unknown, and it is uh, destined, it, it's uh, planned to open as a national uh, wildlife refuge and public recreation area for hiking and biking and possibly even hunting at some time in the near future. It's not open at this time. and. This is a contaminated area that's going to be turned into a nature preserve of some sort? The site as a whole is nearly 6,000 acres, and 1,300 acres are so profoundly contaminated it can never open. The rest of the site is slated to open, even though there continue to be contaminants in the soil. That's astonishing. It's like the radiation won't migrate from one location to another with the wind, with the rain, with the various uh, forces of nature. Uh, let's go back to something you alluded to earlier, which is health problems. What, if any, difficulties with health have shown up in your family, among your childhood friends, anything that might be related to the radioactive contamination from Rocky Flats? Well, in my neighborhood, um, there were many families that, that were ill, and, and there are studies that go all the way back to the 1970s that show higher rates of cancer, leukemia, a number of different uh, health issues, but cancer in particular, brain tumors. We've had some health issues in my family, and, and I've had some health issues. But I think a, a good dramatic example of that is a family directly down the road from us that was a Mormon family. Um, they had uh, they raised their own vegetables, and they had cattle and horses. All of their animals were sterile. They had an organic garden, and we knew this family well because our pony would get into their garden, and I would have to go rescue him, and her, uh, my friend Tamara, her father, would come out and, and yell at us, and that's kind of the relationship we had when, when I was a kid. But as we grew older, um, uh, that family had a lot of health issues, and, and Tamara smith Mesa, who's a woman that I write about in the book, uh, in particular, um, had a series, a number of brain tumors. She just had surgery for her eighth brain tumor. And the main difference between my family and, and her family is that uh, my father tried to dig a well, and we never uh, were able to get water, so we had to go on city water. That family had a well that went directly down into the Stanley Lake water table there, and they've been drinking, they drank the water out of the well, and that family has been very, very ill. So that, has that water been shown to be contaminated by Rocky Flats? Yes, and I want to say that Stanley Lake, which is um, the lake that was just over the rise from our house and uh, Tamara's house is directly on Stanley Lake, the sediment of that lake is contaminated with plutonium to the present day. And plutonium is heavy. It settles down into the sediment. And although that lake continues to be open, astonishingly, for public recreation... Ah. Um, there are signs that say, you know, don't kick up the sediment. My brother was out there not too long ago. Um, he since moved away. This was a couple of years ago, right before the book came out. And he was out walking his dogs, and the dogs were playing in the, in the water. And a boat came around, and, and these two officials said, get your dogs out of the water. And he just kind of laughed, and he said, why? And they said, well, because it's a, a drinking water. 
it is indeed, it supplies drinking water for uh, surrounding communities. And Kurt laughed and said, what would a couple of dog hairs, what would that make a difference? And it's, it wasn't the dog hairs, it's the fact that there's plutonium in that sediment and they don't want it stirred up. Did they actually say that or that's just your knowledge coming in on this? That's uh, my knowledge. That's con that's uh, standard knowledge. I mean, anyone can find out about that that the sediment is contaminated, but they don't have any signs up out there. And they and they didn't say that to my brother at the time. They just said that it was drinking water, and uh, they didn't want any contaminants in it. Of course, it's already contaminated. Why did you choose the title "Full Body Burden"? What does that mean, and how does it relate to your story? Body burden is a term that refers to the amount of um, radioactive material held within the body um, and that continues to emit a constant and ongoing source of radiation. Full body burden refers to um, the level at which um, the government has determined that a worker in particular has reached the limit and should not have any more exposure to radioactivity. One of the interesting things about that term is that, of course, there are people who have been exposed to much lower levels than that full body burden level, and they become ill. Sometimes people are exposed to higher levels, and they don't become ill. So uh, it's kind of a uh, controversial um name in a way. I wanted to use it as a title for the book, not only to refer to that particularly, but also um, to work as a kind of metaphor for the book as a whole, and to hopefully help the reader to see the many ways in which Rocky Flats, the story of Rocky Flats, has affected not only just the community of Arvada and Colorado, but our country as, as a whole with respect to the uh, nuclear weapons and how we tell the story of the Cold War and how we don't tell the story of the Cold War and how eager we are to forget that these things have happened. You've been quoted as saying, I didn't write this book as any sort of polemic or with an agenda in mind. I don't think of myself as an activist and certainly did not in the beginning. I think of myself as a writer, an investigative journalist, and a memoirist. Yet it can't be denied that your book gives tremendous support to the activist perspective on nuclear issues. So how have you reconciled your intentions in writing the book with the perception that uh, you are indeed an activist on this subject? Well, I think I certainly am an activist now in the sense that I'm very concerned with uh, peace and environmental ju environmental justice. Um, and I, I'm a, much more aware of things in a way that I, I wasn't necessarily before. When I started out to write this book, I wanted to tell the story uh, I was very concerned about the fact that um, it was a story that, as I said earlier, people were so uh, willing to forget. There are home builders building houses right up next to the Rocky Flat site on contaminated land, and people don't know. They come in from other places, they buy a house, they don't know. And I thought what was happening uh, was terrible, and the fact that, that Colorado was uh, working so hard to forget the story and whitewash the story of Rocky Flats. And so that's where I was really coming from in the beginning, and also it was just an important, such a big, important part of my life. But the story really is the story of my own sense of awakening as a woman, as a writer, as an environmentalist, as a person concerned with peace and environmental justice and bringing these truths to light. So now I very much think of myself as someone who's deeply engaged in these issues and happy to be engaged in these issues in a way that I was not before. And, of course, we welcome you very strongly into the community because you're such a persuasive and uh, articulate person speaking on these issues. Uh, how is the book doing? What's the response been to it in literary as well as activist circles? Well, the book has been doing great, uh, and I've literally been on the road steady since since June, and will continue to be so into the into the spring. It's just kind of astonishing the kind of response that this book has had. It was just reviewed in the New York Times last week. Uh, it's gotten great reviews all around the country, and also in the uh, in the UK. It came out in uh, London and Ireland and Scotland, and people are reading it over there as well. Um, the BBC is going to be doing a, a film about it. It's just kind of astonishing, the response that I've had. And I have to say, some of the most powerful emotional response I've had is from people who live in Colorado, around Rocky Flats, or around other uh, similar sites like Hanford or the Savannah River site, people whose lives and health and properties, in fact, have been affected by these plants. 
and no one's talking about it. No one's recognizing their stories or acknowledging their health issues. And I've received hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of emails um, from people like this, and so many, in fact, that I started a, a website just to post these stories to kind of get them out into the world. If people wish to purchase your book, Full Body Burden, or if they need to get more information about it, where do they need to go? Well, they can go directly to my website, which is just www.kristeniverson.com. And spell them because you have a lot of E's in there. I do. It's all E's. Thank you. It's K-R-I-S-T-E-N-I-V-E-R-S-E-N, Kristen Iverson. That site links to a number of different booksellers, Amazon and also independent bookstores and that sort of thing. So it's easy to purchase the book through the site. And then you can also see some of the reviews and interviews that I've done. And it also links to the website that I mentioned earlier. And that website is falloutreport.com, falloutreport.com. And that um, has news not only about nuclear weapons sites and nuclear facilities, but I'm also posting all of these incredible stories that I get from readers around the country. Anything else that you would like us to know? Well, I think a number of your listeners might be interested in um, some of the maps and charts that I have posted on my web page and also on Facebook. And these are contamination maps that show the contaminated areas around Rocky Flats and including uh, the plume that from two of the fires that traveled over the city of Denver and exactly where that plume went. And then the number of charts, including a muff chart, missing unaccounted for plutonium, that shows exactly how much was lost over the years, that sort of thing. They're really fascinating maps and charts, and people can find those on uh, my website, kristeniverson.com, under the blog page, or on Facebook, my author page on Facebook, or at falloutreport.com. Well, we will post all of these websites on the nuclearhotseat.com page. Kristen, I want to thank you. This has been a great conversation. I wish you every success with the book. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight to speak with you. Thank you. Kristen Iverson is the author of Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. Recently, while poking around on the Internet, I stumbled across word of a U.S. government program to compensate nuclear workers from Rocky Flats. And this is something that has huge implications for current cases, including the confirmed contaminated workers from the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and also for the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan, who got hit so hard with Fukushima radiation in the days immediately after the start of that nuclear disaster. Terry Berry is Rocky Flats Special Exposure Cohort Co-Petitioner. What that means is she has been working on helping exposed workers get compensation under a little-known government program that actually admits that exposure to radiation is implicated in the creation of at least 22 named cancers. Terry Berry joined us from her home in Colorado. Terry Berry, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us first, how did you become involved with the issue of government compensation to workers at Rocky Flats? It began in 1995 when my husband first became ill with a disease. We had no idea what it was. It's a precancer stomach condition. And he basically has been falling apart since that day. He was actually sick the day I met him in 1988. And uh, we tried for state workers' compensation in the state of Colorado. He had documentation showing that he inhaled and ingested plutonium and americium. And the Department of Energy, through their contractor, Rockwell International, fought us tooth and nail, and we lost fabulously. We did not have an attorney because no one would take the case on because they would be fighting the Department of Energy. And that's how I became involved. How did you first become aware that there was a compensation program available through the federal government for those who worked at Rocky Flats? I became aware before the actual legislation was passed and enacted. There was a reporter... Her name was Laura Frank, or her name is Laura Frank. Um, She worked for the Tennessean, 
and I had met, you know, a group of Rocky Flats sick workers, and we were in touch with each other, and that's how I became aware and started advocating for the federal program. And that was based on my experience with the state of Colorado's workers' compensation program. Why do you feel it was necessary for the federal government to get involved in creating this compensation program? First of all, it's because it was the federal government who made these people sick. It wasn't the state of Colorado. They put the workers in harm's way. You hear that all the time. Uh, These workers were not fully informed or sometimes not even aware of the, what you call a toxic soup or a cancer cocktail, that they worked in on a daily basis, and that's for 10, 20, 30 years. So it was important for, number one, the government to acknowledge that they made these people sick. They were working for the government. They were trying to protect the government, you know, our our nation. And responsibility needed to be laid at the federal government's feet to take care of these workers. Give us a brief description of what the program consists of. It's a complicated program, but one that would work well if it was run properly and according to congressional intent. There are two parts to the program. Part B, B as in boy, will compensate workers or their survivors if a cancer is proven to be related to their work. It will compensate people with chronic beryllium disease and silicosis if they qualify, you know, under the regulations. Part E, as in Edward, will compensate other diseases, and and including the cancers and CBD, but that program will only pay for wage loss and full body impairment. But both parts will cover all medical expenses, and that's a fabulous, wonderful benefit because there's no deductible that comes out of the pocket of the workers. When you said that they have to qualify under the regulations, What does qualification consist of? First, you have to prove that you worked at Rocky Flats. And in some cases, that has been difficult for a few of the workers. Then you have to have a diagnosis. And believe it or not, that sometimes can be an issue. Under Part B, if you have a cancer and the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health says that radiation caused the cancer by 50% or greater, then you're compensated for the $150,000 under Part B. Or if you're a member of the special exposure cohort and have one of the 22 legislated specified cancers, then you're automatically covered and receive the $150,000. Okay, this is one of the key pieces that attracted me to us talking about this, and that is the acknowledgement of 22 cancers resulting from exposure to radiation. How did this list, to the best of your knowledge, come about? I am almost 100% positive that the, the original 22 cancers came from the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, and that legislation covers uranium workers the workers who worked in the mines, the mills, and transported the uranium to the mills and then processed down the line into the actual bombs. So that's where the 22 cancers came from. What's remarkable about that is that there is so much denial in the industry, specifically as regards the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan or the accident that took place in Carlsbad, New Mexico where there was an explosion underground at the WIP site, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, and workers were exposed to plutonium and americium, and there are 22 confirmed cases of the workers being contaminated, and yet the government and waste control specialists who operate the site are saying, ah, it's no big deal. Where on the flip side, here is the acknowledgement in connection with Rocky Flats that 22 cancers can be linked to radiation exposure. So there's there's some implication in there that I think it's important for people to understand. Number one, I feel terrible about those workers. I do believe that they were exposed. There is no safe level of exposure. Radiation can cause cancer or it can contribute 
to the development of cancer. The latency period, from what I understand, is about 10 years. So these workers, I'm sure they're they're young and, and vibrant and in the best of health right now, they have to look out 10 years, 20 years down the road before they would see any real ill effects, unless it was a massive dose, which I don't think it was a massive dose, except for the, the sailors on the Reagan. I'm sure they got totally hot. Yes, that was catastrophic exposure, and we have been following that very closely on nuclear hot seat. You mentioned a term, special exposure cohort, as being a separate class of workers. What does that mean? That means workers who qualify for that class do not have to have their dose reconstructed by NIOSH. That's the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. It's a division of CDC. They don't have to have their dose reconstructed because it's assumed that the radiation caused the cancer, one of those 22 cancers. Right now, Rocky Flats is covered from 1952 through the end of 1983. Um, The reason for that class is because NIOSH did not have enough documentation of radiation exposure, especially for neptunium, thorium, and uranium-233, to develop a method to reconstruct dose for those Rocky Flats workers. It's so complicated. I feel bad for your audience. No, this is just typical of the way the government operates in all things nuclear. That's interesting. So for the 22, the workers with 22, one of the 22 cancers, they're automatically compensated the $150,000 under Part B, and they're eligible for wage loss and impairment under Part E. So the max that they can receive, I think, is $400,000. There's a petition involving the special exposure cohort. Tell us what that is about. That's fairly simple. I mean, that's one of the simple things with this program. There's a form you can fill out. Basically, it says, I don't believe NIOSH can reconstruct dose for this site. I did this with the petitioner for Rocky Flats. It was basically a simple process. And you give the reasons why you don't think they can reconstruct dose. Lack of monitoring data is one of them. Falsification of records is another one. Destruction of records is, is another one. And then there's a debate or a discussion between NIOSH and the Advisory Board on Radiation and Worker Health, and the the petitioners are involved with that also. And then they come to an agreement. You know, sometimes the board will agree with NIOSH that they can reconstruct dose. Fortunately for Rocky Flats, well, actually, NIOSH said that they cannot reconstruct dose up until the end of 1983. And the board agreed with them, and that's why we have it. So how accurate were the Department of Energy records, especially for non-radioactive exposures? They're basically non-existent for the non-radioactive materials. I have a document. um, It's titled Rocky Flats 1999 Radiological Assessment of Corporation Report on the Rocky Flats Plant. And it says, and I'm quoting this, it is important to understand that As is often the case, monitoring data for carbon tetrachloride and other chemicals are not as available as our data for radionuclides. It's across the complex. I mean, we have one from Los Alamos in 2013 that says only 30% of the assessments have been completed. Paducah, which is in Kentucky, this is 2014, They have not yet compiled a comprehensive baseline exposure assessment. So even to this day, they're not monitoring all of the non-radioactive exposures. Is there anything that can be done to recreate these records? I'm sure everybody thinks they can. When it comes to NIOSH and dose reconstruction, they do have some sites that they use co-worker models for. Co-worker models? Yes. It's a method where they'll take a group of workers that do have monitoring data 
and somehow develop a method to use that to reconstruct dose for workers who were not monitored. How accurate do you think that is? I don't think it's accurate at all. It's, it's pure guesswork because the worker that they're using for the co-worker model may not represent the worker right next to him. That worker might have gotten hotter than the worker they're using. I've never agreed with dose reconstruction. The advocates across the country hate dose reconstruction because it's guesswork as far as we're concerned. You have advocated for the federal compensation program and a reform that happened in 2004. What do you see your mission as being? My mission is to make sure that the legislation is implemented by the agencies as Congress intended. And I don't see that happening. Otherwise, I still would not be advocating. Going back to the program itself, how do advocates help the claimants? We help them in a variety of ways. I work with a bunch of people across the country, but I'm going to say about 15 really excellent advocates. And we monitor the program and their implementation, which means that we read NIOSH's white papers on dose reconstruction. We read the Department of Labor's final bulletins and circulars. And if we see that it's not following what we think Congress meant, and we kind of do know what Congress meant, we go to the agencies and, and, and voice our opinion. And we also take it to Congress. I have a, a, I work with a, a bunch of really good staffers in Congress. And then we go to the press and try to get a change. How many claimants have been able to get settlement from the government as a result of this program? For Rocky Flat, 2,549 have been compensated. And for the workers across the country, it is 71,028 cases. Has there been a percentage of people or a number of people refused for the program? And if so, how many would that cohort consist of? Approval rate on average is running about 30%. So 70% of the people are being denied. Wow, that must be heartbreaking for them. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Part E is the most heartbreaking because under Part E, all you need to do is prove that an exposure was a significant factor in causing, contributing to, or aggravating a disease. You don't have to prove that it caused the disease. So if you have someone with COPD... Which stands for? Chronic Obstructive pulmonary disease, you see that advertised on TV all the time, who worked as a welder around all these welding fumes for 20 years, and they're denied saying that the welding fumes didn't cause that. It's extremely insulting for whoever makes these decisions to assume that the welding, you know, and uh, and whatever else they're welding, you know, the, the, the uranium or the beryllium, that that didn't at least aggravate the condition, it's it's a ridiculous assumption. Do you feel that it's necessary for a claimant to hire an attorney or authorized representative when they file a claim in this case? I recommend hiring someone for Part E claims. I really do. It's gotten a lot worse than what it set out to be and what it was meant to be. When it comes to special exposure cohorts, no. Because a special exposure cohort, Department of Labor is excellent at processing those claims. If a claimant was denied because the POC, the probability of causation, came in under 50% and then SEC class is added, they are fantastic about going back in their files, locating the denied claims, and then processing it. I think it takes, oh, maybe two months to get them all. So for SEC claims, no, you don't need an attorney. But help is definitely needed. And I don't represent people, okay? I I can't do that anymore. It's just too aggravating for me. But some of these, especially the more difficult cases, yes, I would recommend hiring someone.
And that's sad because it wasn't intended to be like that. There's a new legislated advisory board from the Department of Labor in connection with this program. What is it and what is your opinion of it? It is something that the advocates have been pushing for for, oh, about four years now. First of all, the the General Accountability Office, which is a watchdog of the United States government, recommended that Department of Labor have this board. The National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine recommended they have uh, Department of Labor have this board because Part E is a mess and it is not living up to congressional intent. This board will review the database that is used to adjudicate claims. It's called the site exposure matrix to make sure that it's accurate and it reflects the best science when it comes to linking disease and exposure. They will advise the Department of Labor's industrial hygienists and toxicologists on what is necessary to make judgment calls when it comes to exposure assessments. And it would add transparency. We will have the ability, the public will have the ability to raise issues with this board in a public forum, whereas there is nothing like that now except for the NIOSH board. And is this in place already? No, it was just legislated, and uh, President Obama signed the legislation December 19th of 2014. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, we were keeping, we were holding our breath. It, it, it took forever to get this done. It's a simple thing, but money was the issue. Who's going to fund it? And the legislation requires the president to appoint the board by April 19th of 2015. So that is coming up very quickly. Yes. As you move forward, what do you see your continuing role being in this entire arena for getting compensation for the workers who were at Rocky Flats? My continuing role is to try to convince NIOSH and their advisory board to expand the SEC class through closure, which is 2005. When it comes to Part E, I'm still going to monitor the new board and look at it from the public's point of view and and hope to work with them like I do with the NIOSH board, bringing issues to their attention, that type of thing. And hopefully between the two boards, we will finally achieve justice for these workers at Rocky Flats. One last question. How is your husband now? He's not that well. He's been sick, like I said, from the day I met him, and there's continuing problems with him. He just recently went in for his second neck surgery in November, but it didn't relieve all the pain that is involved with it. He still has a kidney issue. He still has a stomach issue. So he's not doing, I mean, for somebody that's sick, he's doing well. He doesn't have cancer, fortunately, and we're very grateful that, for that. And, and we live day to day, but he's not well. He's sick. I'm so sorry to hear that and so sorry to have that as the vision for any workers or the sailors who have been exposed to radiation. But at least there is some compensation and, more importantly, some acknowledgement coming from our government that shows that they agree that radiation does create health risks. Yes, we are fortunate that way. I remember seeing when the issue with the the sailors came up online, I remember seeing a picture of the sailors scrubbing the deck. And I looked at that picture and I said, where is their protection? They had no face masks. Some of them didn't have gloves. They're walking in this muck of soap and radiation. And it's like, how did that ship's captain allow them to do that? Don't they know? Haven't they learned anything? That, of course, is a major question that has no good answer. For now, Terry Berry, I want to thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. I hope that this helps people understand and maybe reach people who don't know about this program who qualify for it. One can only hope. That was Terry Berry, Rocky Flats Special Exposure Cohort Co-Petitioner. 
To access that list of 22 cancers and learn more about the program for compensating exposed workers, you can go to the Alliance of Nuclear Workers Advocacy Groups page. It's a little long to spell out here. You can find it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 187. My thanks to Paul C. Garner, lead attorney on the USS Reagan case, for his help with the background materials on the Rocky Flats Compensation Program story, and to Kristen Iverson for her introduction to Terry Berry. Activist shout-out! This is with gratitude to all of the many activists who put together this weekend's upcoming conference on shutting down Diablo Canyon and coordinating all West Coast groups into a single united force. Huge amounts of work were required to put that event together. My thanks to the members of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, Mary Beth Brangan of the Ecological Options Network, and many, many others whose names I don't have in front of me right now, but I hope to have by next week. Great work, and if I can arrange dog care, I will be there. John Stewart! Hola! I caught you at it on your January 15th, 2015 bit about the Keystone XL pipeline, you showed a picture of the Peanuts character Pigpen, and then you said, Look at our children! This is what the Keystone XL pipeline has done to them! They are so contaminated we should seal them up in a drum and bury them under Nevada. Obscure? Yes, but there it was, a veiled reference to the failed Yucca Mountain. You keep flirting with the nuclear story, John, but when will you make a commitment? Let's talk it over when I'm in New York for Dr. Caldecott's symposium. Deal? Here's today's final thought. Let's all have pen pals, either analog or digital. As you heard earlier, Sister Megan Rice is still in prison. Why don't we all send her a note, a letter of appreciation for the work that she has done on our behalf? You can send it to Megan Rice, 88101-020. No, that's not her address. That's her prisoner number. MDC Brooklyn, which stands for Metropolitan Detention Center, P.O. Box 329002, Brooklyn, New York, 11232. I'm certain that she would enjoy hearing from us. And while you're at it, let's tweet the Pope. His address is at Pontifex, P-O-N-T-I-F like Frank, E-X. And you can not only encourage him to speak out against nuclear as a solution to climate change, but also see if he can speak out for Sister Megan Rice. Wouldn't that be fun? This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 20th, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, the Bristol Herald Courier, WJHL, MiamiHerald.com, DailyMail.co.uk, AFP, AP, NHK, Reuters, The Guardian, NPR, KITV, NOAA Coral Reef Watch, Williams Lake Tribune, The New York Times, University of California, Santa Barbara, JapanTimes.com, BBC.com, English.hani.co.kr, Sputniknews.com, TheFishSite.com, Spiegel.de, and the ever-vigilant, totally popular, extremely cool Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, where you are invited to join us, friend us, and tweet to either John Stewart or the Pope about us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes, you can subscribe under podcasts, and you can also find past episodes on NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. 
We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed to not-for-profit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art communicating, reminding you to tweet the Pope at at symbol pontifex, And we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to 